We don't do it, but we help you, the VOAD members, organizations do it through facilitation and coordination. FEMA voluntary agency liaisons are the central point of coordination among state, local, tribal, territorial, and federal governments, as well as the voluntary faith-based and community organizations responding in times of disaster. Government resources are designated for a very specific purpose. Non-governmental resources can be much more flexible in nature and are often quicker to respond. We the VALs support the management of unsolicited spontaneous volunteers, unsolicited donations, both cash and in kind, and coordination of trained groups responding to provide a variety of disaster services. VALs aid in addressing unmet needs for individuals following a disaster in both immediate and long-term recovery efforts. VALs are a source of FEMA programmatic information and subject matter expertise. VALs must know how to bring in the right resources at the right time and how to appropriately engage with those organizations. One way I like to see the VAL role is that we are an old style uh, community organizers focused on getting services to low income people after a disaster. The people who fall through the current safety net of government disaster assistance. We are looking to identify partners, agencies to fill the gaps in needs that the government is unable to address. Let's go to the next slide. So what do VALs do? We report to our FEMA counterparts, the states and our voluntary organization partners by providing streamlined, comprehensive, and accessible information regarding federal programs, policies, public-private connections, and situational awareness. For example, we may inform the state what volunteer organizations are coming into the disaster area and what services are being provided. We try and link these organizations with the state so they can better coordinate the response. The XYZ organizations are cleaning out houses in Washington County this coming Saturday. Sometimes these organizations arrive unannounced and that can catch the state off guard. We work hard to avoid that type of a scenario. Try and build collaborations. We provide referrals to disaster survivors with unmet needs in coordination with FEMA individual assistance and you, the voluntary organizations. We are often alerted when someone comes across a family in the field, for example, in particular need, and use our contacts to resolve as many of these issues as we can. We may set up coordination calls with partners if the VOAD requests that support or they're unable to do this for any reason. We provide guidance and technical assistance. Many communities, particularly in New England, have not experienced recent disasters. We provide tools and training on how to coordinate muck and guts, how to provide long-term uh, recovery, how to form long-term recovery groups, et cetera. We help the state develop a donations management strategy, provide messaging, information on crowdsourcing, social media outlets, et cetera. We build capacity. During peacetime or blue skies, we work with the state VOAD leadership to build the capacity of the New England VOAD and its member organizations. We encourage the sharing of best practices and resources and support the state VOADs with training exercises and capacity building. We have quarterly New England VOAD calls with guest speakers. These help us share best practices and build collaborations between the states and the partner organizations. If any of you on this call are not on our distro list and you'd like to receive notices of these meetings, just send Katie and I an email and uh, we'll add you to this distribution list. We send out a variety of information we think uh, that would be helpful to you, our partners. Who do VALs work with? Um, slide four. Our primary partner is with you our VOAD partners and the states, generally the state IA officer or state VAL if one is assigned. 
We also partner with other federal agencies, including the Department of Agriculture, Housing and Urban Development, the Small Business Administration. Sometimes these federal partners have programs relevant to the VOAD partners, and we can facilitate that interaction. Another important federal partner is the Corporation for National and Community Service, the umbrella organization of AmeriCorps. On several occasions, we have helped mission assign the AmeriCorps to provide needed volunteers to the state. In Connecticut, for example, they staffed a 211 call center to capture unmet needs with AmeriCorps volunteers. AmeriCorps uh, in, in Maine is very strong, and I know that you have uh, they have a close partnership with the VOAD. Let's go to slide five. Just a little history of the BOAD movement. Uh, in response or the response to Hurricane Camille, a category five hurricane, 1969, uh, clearly demonstrated the need for greater coordination of the voluntary organizations. The media reported on unnecessary duplication, lack of resources, untrained volunteers, and a woefully inadequate response to the needs of the survivors. As a result, in 1970, seven national disaster response organizations met in Washington, D.C. to find a better way to coordinate and collaborate, and the National VOAD was born. Since that time, a state VOAD has formed in each of the 50 states. The VOAD movement has, become, uh, has come a, a long way in my time. I've seen it grow. Uh, there are now 70 member organizations. And uh, again, uh, with 700 folks in attendance of the last VOAD conference, it really uh, is striking how uh, large this movement has become. Slide six. These are just some of our partners uh, within the VOAD. These organizations may not have a presence in Maine or in Region 1. However, we can reach out to them, and if they have the capacity, uh, they just might come to New England and provide services. For example, the Jewish response to disaster, or Nahama, does not have a presence on any New England state VOADs. However, they, play, they played a large role in coordinating volunteers to clean out houses on several New England disasters. Many local organizations do not understand the national disaster role their organizations might play. For example, Catholic Charities in Connecticut did not know that they provided disaster case management services nationally. We, uh, the VALs, reached back to Catholic Charities headquarters in Washington and advised them that the local diocese needed support. They came to Connecticut, trained the local leadership, and ended up leading the disaster case management for Hurricane Sandy in Connecticut. And I would like to just take a moment to provide just a few examples of what VOAD groups in New England have done during past disaster responses that I've been on. Sheltering, American Red Cross has a ready list of potential shelters they can open and staff. Child care, the Church of the Brethren provide childcare and shelters with trained and vetted volunteers. Mass feeding, the Salvation Army has an inventory of food kitchens placed around the country and feeding vehicles that serve impacted neighborhoods. Mucking and gutting and mold remediation. In Connecticut, during the Hurricane Sandy response, Mormon Helping Hands coordinated and cleaned out many homes. During the Rhode Island floods, there were seven national organizations carrying out muckouts around the state simultaneously. Spiritual and emotional care. The Presbyterian Disaster Services deployed to a disaster and trained local clergy on how to provide spiritual and emotional support. Debris removal. Team Rubicon has chainsaw teams that remove downed trees. Most recently, they assisted with families in Connecticut that could not afford the expense of tree removal. The Southern Baptists also have done this in New England on many occasions, and those teams generally come from Maine. Adventist community services are experts 
in managing warehouses, and they did a fantastic job uh, of managing a very tough warehouse situation after the Sandy Hook shooting in Connecticut. Slide seven. Emergency managers and disaster volunteers wear, wear many hats in the field of, of disaster. Bows too play many roles, which can be loosely defined on where we are in the, in the disaster cycle. Just briefly, uh, there's four um, cycles within, in, within uh, uh, any particular disaster scenario preparedness, mitigation, response, and recovery. Preparedness uh, is pre preparing to handle for an emergency. Examples like preparing plans, uh, carrying out exercises, trainings for staff and volunteers. Mitigation is preventing future emergencies or minimizing the effects of future emergencies. For example, uh, the Red Cross has a program that installs smoke detectors for at-risk communities. Another uh, example is incorporating mitigation efforts and staff into the long-term recovery process so that you build back safer and stronger. Uh, I'm gonna talk about response next and Katie is gonna cover uh, recovery in just a minute. Uh, next slide. Bowels in response. Uh, what do VOAD partners do in response primarily? Debris removal, chainsaw teams, open and managed shelters or warming or cooling centers, provide shower facilities and laundry facilities, pet sheltering, children's services, potentially providing sports shelters, as I mentioned earlier, mud outs and mold, rem mold remediation, making and providing meals, language and cultural interpretation, interpreting, which is very important uh, these days. We heavily rely on our partners to, to do that. Uh, spiritual and emotional care. During a response, Katie and I as VALS can help you with some of the following. We can act as your initial federal point of contact. We may organize a BOAD partner call between state BOADs on a more regional uh, scale disaster. We can provide meeting space and possibly a temporary workspace within the federal joint field office once it's set up. For example, during Irene in Vermont, <clears throat> we housed Vermont's 211 call center after their facility was lost during the flood. Uh, we will provide briefs to organizations on federal programs and share any data or on the ground information that we have. We'll provide contacts and or introductions to national partners that may have staff, resources, or money that they can uh, commit to the uh, response effort, support donations, management efforts, and link BOAD partners with other federal partners, including SBA, Department for Agriculture, Housing and Urban Development, Health and Human Services, et cetera. Any questions uh, thus far? All right, Katie uh, will cover the rest of the slides. Thanks so much, John. Let's see if I can. All right. Um, so, you know, John has really given a really comprehensive overview of what um, what it is we do and ways we can help. So I'm really just going to continue in some of the other phases and some of the other tangible things we can kind of bring to the table um, during response, as he mentioned. Uh, we're really just like you guys trying to get our bearings on how what's it, what was the scope of the impact, um, who was impacted, where was the where were the impacts, um, and what are the unmet needs, right? So how can we figure out what resources are brought to bear locally, um, what are coming in from around the state, and then what is that unmet need, and how can we bring additional resources into the state in the form of um, voluntary agency partners um, from across New England or across the country to help meet those needs. Uh, and so one, one place we do that here in New England is at our Regional Response Coordination Center. 
So um, you guys may or may not have visited this uh, center. It's located in Maynard, Massachusetts. It's a bunker under the ground. Uh, these are our desks, a picture of our desks in the RRCC. We have um, two voluntary agency liaison desks, a number of mass care desks, and then an American Red Cross liaison in there specifically because of their uh, federal charter. Um, they have a seat in our regional response coordination centers and then our national response coordination center. So when we're sitting at these desks, um, this is often activated when we anticipate significant impacts in one or more of our states here in New England, and it provides us a central location to coordinate across um, state operations. So we have direct reach back. Oftentimes we'll have a, a FEMA liaison officer or an entire incident management assistance team, an IMAT team embedded at each of the state emergency operations center and they can reach back to us at the RRCC and um, ask for things like federal commodities, um, federal support, provide situational awareness, um, make sure communications continue to flow between the state and um, the federal government. And so we will be staffing this and kind of keeping our eye on uh, what's going on across the impact areas um, around Region 1. Um, we also, again, communicate with our National Response Coordination Center, where we would have a voluntary agency liaison desk there as well. Um, also, National VOAD has a desk at the NRCC, so we can reach back directly to some of the National VOAD leadership and talk about what our needs are. They can start seeing a lot of things um, we can't on a national scope. So if you can imagine big impacts like they just had with Hurricane Fiona in Puerto Rico, or Ian down in Florida. Um, as you can imagine, they can start getting visibility on sort of the movements on a big scale of all sorts of stuff heading towards Florida and Puerto Rico, whether it be donations or teams of people or um, financial donations or resources. Um, and so they can start providing a lot of situational awareness to the state and to the vowels in that region on you know, what's coming at them and how they can start coordinating those in inbound resources. So they can be a huge asset to us um, here in New England and for coordination with you guys um, at the state level. Um, and then of course, the most important part of what we do every day during any time really would be those uh, regular coordination calls with you guys, with the VOAB partners. As John mentioned, um, sometimes we understand that when when you guys get busy, you guys get busy. So it's not uncommon, especially here in New England, for John and I to help facilitate those initial early calls on behalf of a state VOED simply because the leadership is tied up responding. Um, so we, of course, always want bench depth within our VOEDs themselves to be able to, you know, have somebody else maybe step up and run those calls. But, you know, we're a smaller team up here. We have less frequent impacts. So that is absolutely something John and I could help support early on in a response. Um, one of the primary activities uh, that we'll focus on early in particular is that volunteer and donations management. It is a part of ESF-6 of the mass care, um, you know, bucket, mass care, hu housing, human services, and I'm missing one other, <laughs> but it's bigger than just sheltering and feeding. And so we do work with our states to try to create that order out of chaos. Um, it's going to be all of our states have a volunteer and donations management plan or plans, um, which actually up here in New England are pretty regularly and consistently updated and reviewed. Uh, so really, we would just be helping the state kind of um, implement those plans, making sure there was a place for the unsolicited stuff and the spontaneous volunteers to be, you know, um, put to good use. Um, or at the very least not become an impediment on the disaster areas so that first responders and those homeowners can get to their properties and be able to start cleaning up um, and, and salvaging you know, um, their, their uh, belongings without having donations kind of getting in the way or volunteers. This may include um, helping the state to stand up state-led task forces, which would be where we bring in you know, federal and state partners relevant to that subject matter, but also you guys as voluntary agency partners that have a stake in those, um, you know, volunteer management or donations management. Um, it could be now 
there's a lot of virtual volunteer reception centers happening and I think we all saw that um, in a big way throughout COVID so those are being more and more utilized um, and you know commonplace to um, direct folks to sign up online instead of deploying in person um, identifying teams to manage warehouses and and then one of the biggest um, one of the biggest things FEMA does alongside the states is the the messaging around volunteer and donations um, regardless of the impact where how <laughs> uh, what what the cause of damage is the messaging never changes um, and so that's something we can work with states on and you know public information officers can have these things kind of pre-scripted and ready to go um, and what we do is just force multiply that from the local level to the state to the federal level right so it's going to be um, you know, don't self-deploy, know before you go, get affiliated with a um, with a reputable organization, um, give sensibly, know where your donations are, are going. If you're going to give in-kind donations, make sure you have a recipient for that and that it's a needed item, but always cash is best, right? So, um, so these, these messages are all the time out there, so we can work um, with you guys and with your public information officers and kind of having these ready to go, um, you know, regardless of what hits um, there, you know, everything's these little memes and um, social things that are really catch the eye for social media or the way people are messaging nowadays. So um, that's something we can work with you guys on. And then again, replicate that at the federal level so that we're just force multiplying your message. Um, you guys are probably very aware of this group by now throughout COVID. Our headquarters, FEMA headquarters uh, donations unit stood up and has become a kind of a permanent unit at FEMA headquarters where um, they are fielding offers of donations um, from large corporations, the private sector, really um, all over the United States um, and trying to match them to those that may be able to put them to use based on the donor intent. Sometimes they're earmarked for certain disasters. Sometimes they are, you know, for COVID and they're kind of general for anybody who can put them to use. But um, the four pillars of this donations unit are to honor the donor intent. Who is it intended for? Where is it going? Um, match donations where they're needed most. So we don't want to inundate folks that may be able to get the resources themselves. We want to make sure they can go where they're where they're actually needed, um, be fair and equitable while doing so, and then um, and then be able to track it so that we can kind of um, track the progress and how much we're this uh, the impact that this donations unit has on um, facilitating these matches. Um, so the email address is there. You can always reach out to them. Um, there is always a dashboard available as well, which will pop into the chat um, in just a minute make a note for myself so I don't forget to do that. But there is a donations dashboard that is updated daily and that always has um, the available donations, who they're intended for. You can go in and take a look and if there's anything you guys are in need of, you can um, uh, you can put a request in for it. Um, you can also submit requests if, if you want headquarters to be on the lookout for something. Um, you can do that as well. Now, John, as you know, when when things are specifically earmarked for New England or specifically relevant, um, John is very good about getting those out to you. Um, they they come to John and I, and we blast those out to you guys as soon as we get them uh, to make those donations offers available. Um, so you can see some of the staggering numbers just since COVID-19, since this started, um, we have, let's see, completed uh, 495 donations matching offers, which equates to 434.7 million unique items that have gone through this sort of these channels, um, which is pretty, pretty impressive and staggering. And these numbers don't even include some of the major disasters like Ian, this is sort of just the COVID side of the house. So that's that's sort of kind of big picture. Some of the stuff we might you might see the valves doing in response as we start transitioning into recovery. Um, 
these next few slides are going to assume that there is a federal declaration for individual assistance, which means sort of FEMA's recovery programs are turned on. Um, so some and that we have sort of boots on the ground and there's um, individual and households can apply for FEMA assistance. Um, so some things the VALS might be doing during this time would be to work with you all on determining the best recovery strategies. So does it look like we're going to need long term recovery groups and whereabouts? And do we think we'd want to do it by city, by county, by region? You know, what makes the most sense? Um, how might we piece together disaster case management from various agencies? Um, how are we going to tie in the response efforts to transitioning folks into long term recovery? Um, so all those conversations, we can help provide technical assistance on uh, and some you know leading practices on how to get get those things done. Um, Encourage engagement from all sectors of the community. So we have other folks here at FEMA that work with the private sector. We have philanthropic advisors. Uh, so, I mean, you guys have great networks of partners um, across the state of Maine. So um, it, in, depending on the state we're responding in, um, we're needed in these areas more than others. So we, we are there really just to help facilitate what you guys need us to help facilitate with not to take the place of um, relationships you guys already have or you know things you're able to do for yourself. We're really just there to force multiply um, and bring additional uh, partnerships to the table that you might not already have. Um, so we can uh, then also work on the development of long-term recovery groups. So um, as John mentioned, we will have voluntary agency liaisons boots on the ground and can actually go out and do that community organizing and help build those um, foundation, that grassroots foundation of long term recovery groups um, alongside uh, you guys following a disaster. So um, our primary roles are to inform, advise and connect. Um, there's kind of two columns here, but really everything is relevant to both voluntary agencies and emergency management. But some specific things VALS can do is um, a lot of what we're going to do is help explain FEMA to you guys and help explain uh, what you guys bring to bear to FEMA and how to appropriately plug in voluntary agency partners. Talk about the um, ask, not task, right? Because uh, FEMA, you know, us being an, a top down emergency management agency that goes by chain of command, they often misunderstand how we work with our VOAB partners with the four C's and that there's no command and control there, right? That we have a partnership and we work together and we coordinate and collaborate, but there's no sort of top down structure. So a lot of what we do is help um, explain that to FEMA and explain how you guys plug into the, the larger recovery response and recovery network. Um, but what we can provide to you guys and also emergency management is explanation of FEMA programs, so overviews of our FEMA individual assistance, public assistance and mitigation programs, our sequence of delivery, which is the order in which people get benefits following federal declarations. Um, and that's it. So so how how where they get things first, second, third, fourth, and then what ends up in long term recovery. Um, as John mentioned earlier, data data is going to become a, a big um, a big thing that we can do with summary reports by providing you with registration data, how many people in these areas are registering, what are the impacts looking like, what kind of populations were impacted. Um, when appropriate, our Privacy Act information, which means actual personally identifiable information of the applicants registering for FEMA um, for those case managers in order to provide additional assistance. There are some stringent requirements to meet to make sure there's a true need to know that kind of information. But um, for folks like disaster case managers that are really trying to get folks through the rest of their recovery, they may have a valid need to know. And so we can work um, help folks through that process. Um, oh, thanks, John. I was looking at my chat on the uh, on the phone because I can't see it here on my, while I'm presenting. Um, so 
again, technical assistance for long term recovery group formation. And that might look like, um, you know, as each of the subcommittees of long term recovery groups form, whether it be, you know, construction or case management or volunteer or donations management, emotional and spiritual care, fundraising, um, we can provide samples and sort of um, ideas on partners to bring to the table to help make each of those subcommittees successful. Um, we can bring we can bring in um, where we might not have subject matter expertise, some of the national VOAD recovery tools workshops, for example, um, connect with other recovery groups across the country that have had successes that may have similar communities that are impacted to you guys in Maine um, to share best practices, that sort of thing. And then, as John mentioned, our connection to other federal agencies. So one of FEMA's key charters in disasters is to be the coordinating agency for the family of federal agencies. Um, so we don't always just represent, we, well, we, we speak for FEMA only. However, we, um, we work with our entire federal family. So, um, you know, if you guys do need connections to SBA and HUD and USDA, and um, like I said, a lot of them have relevant disaster programs, but some of them have relevant peacetime programs, which can also have resources for repair and rebuild and other programs that um, might be great matches for long term recovery. Um, so, yeah, so and then, you know, we've covered most of this, but we'll work on state volunteer and donations management plans. Um, try to head off rumors that are going on in the uh, out in the field. Um, a lot of time, two on two on one plays a huge role in that. They they actually usually let us know a lot of times what is um, uh, what the rumor mill is out in the field, and then we can get some public messaging out um, to combat that and try to head off uh, rumors before they get out of control. So they're they're a huge partner um, to you guys to us. Any questions so far? All right, and then really just in preparedness and mitigation, um, you're looking at it, right? So I think the biggest thing we do in preparedness is meet you guys, get to know you, have you guys get to know us, know who to call, um, feeling comfortable to pick up that phone and ask questions. And really that's the, that's the most important part of what we're doing here today. If you've taken nothing else away from this presentation, um, know that John and I are your um, your liaisons to FEMA and to FEMA Region 1 and to your federal network of um, partners. And we are happy to work with you um, anytime you pick up the phone and reach out to us. Um, so we can help uh, connect you guys with additional community education or preparedness um, presentations, trainings, exercises, um, create connections to other areas of FEMA, like our faith based office down in head at FEMA headquarters. Um, which Marcus Coleman runs now, and I think some of you guys are familiar with Marcus, and he has done some presentations up here in New England. Um, our disability integration partners, Kate McCarthy Barnett at FEMA Region 1 may be a familiar name to you guys, and she works with our disability partners um, across New England. Uh, we have a tribal liaison, uh, Gina Murado, which you guys probably know, and she works with the tribes up in Maine. Um, and if it, you guys ever wanted to try to, you know, build some closer relationships with the tribal communities, we could, we could, you know, help to the extent we could be helpful in that. Um, we have our preparedness division, which you guys are very familiar with Arlene and now um, who retired and now, you know, Jed Fiato works in that division. So we can also help um, make sure you guys are, if you ever had questions on public assistance or mitigation programs, we could bring in subject matter experts. Uh, to provide overviews in those areas as well. Um, and then so this is just kind of the map of how this is kind of a harder map to see. We have a different one that actually has the regional val points of contact on it. Um, but you see up here, region one, um, we cover the six New England states and really um, as, as mentioned before, like our, our job is to get to know our state VOADs, our state individual assistance officers, our liaisons to the VOAD at the state level, mass care um, partners, um, maintain relationships with our national points of contact. So all the national VOAD partners and um, 
we we respond all over the country, so we get to see them out out in the field and in, in various um, disasters. And then, of course, annually at the National Web Conference is one of the best places for us to trade those business cards and get up to speed on the latest and greatest, um, participate in trainings, exercises, and programs, and uh, and provide some of that non-Stafford disaster support. So when when your events don't, you know, as most, of course, in New England do not rise to the level of a federal major disaster declaration. Um, John and I, we may not be boots on the ground, we may not be able to be up there in person and have sort of a big field presence, but we can absolutely always provide technical assistance. Um, it's more common than not, obviously, for us here to have those kinds of events where we may need localized long-term recovery efforts, something smaller, something really targeted at a specific community or population, and we can help um, you know, navigate some models that might work um, really for any kind of impact that we have up here alongside you guys. Um, so then we, we will share this presentation with you guys. Uh, these are just some links if you guys wanna learn more. We have a new FEMA independent study course that's out, uh, 289 Voluntary Agency Liaison Overview. Um, it goes over state and FEMA val roles. Um, not, it's just real high level, um, kind of what we covered today. We have our websites, uh, the Volunteer and Donations Management Support Annex, our brochure on volunteering and donating successfully, of course, the National Board website, ESF6 Annex. So just some takeaway links for you guys. Um, and that is our contact information. Hopefully you all have that. Um, and that that's really all we had to share today. Uh, any questions or comments from the group? Question yeah. from Annie. <clears throat> Hi, Catherine. Thank you so much for all this information. It was definitely beneficial for me. Um, I thank you, John, as well. Um, I had two just clarifying questions this afternoon, um, and please excuse my ignorance, but for my own edification, the RRCC, is that something that is like essentially activated, or is it more of like a full-time, fully staffed, round-the-clock, just kind of there and on the ready whenever something happens kind of um, scenario? That's a great question. Um, so it is activated when there are impacts, but we have a 24 seven watch center that is staffed there. So we do have staff there 24 um, seven that is always monitoring communications with our national response coordination center, all the other 10 regional offices, all six of our state emergency operations centers, um, so there is always people there, but then depending on they'll have like a level one, two, three activation, which may be uh, just a couple key staff to a couple of our emergency support functions activated to a full blown activation, which would have all the components, the bells and whistles. Um, so if you're familiar with the emergency support function structure, each there's like one, two, three, four, five, they each cover different subject areas like transportation. Um, uh, infrastructure, uh, agriculture, uh, individual assistance, volunteer donations, what have you. So they'll activate um, the the emergency support functions depending on the size and scope of the anticipated impacts. Um, and that can always be adjusted. And then sometimes it could be 12 hour shifts or sometimes it could be round the clock 24 hour shifts. So. Right now, our Regional Response Coordination Center in Maynard um, serves as pretty much a daily workspace for our staff. So we can go in there and John and I go in there one day a week and we work out of there and it just keeps the equipment up to date and it keeps us comfortable in the environment and fresh um, and it keeps everything working. Um, but when it gets activated, we would be there um, sort of round the clock. That's a great question. Thanks so much. Um, and then the, the second clarifying question, um, with that being said, are you and John, um, do you deploy 
to other RRCCs? Um, and if so, do you tend to notify states in advance and who will be behind to cover? Yeah, so um, we do deploy. Um, I just got back from um, from Florida. I was down there for Hurricane Ian for the last 30 days. Um, we we try really hard if something's going to hit New England to have one of us back here. Um, lately, the last I'd say five, six years that's worked out well with COVID, one of us has always sort of been here and been part of our RRCC activations. But there have been plenty of times where the both of us are also out. And um, thankfully, we haven't had impacts when that has happened, and they probably would bring us back. But yes, we would absolutely communicate with you guys as to who the primary point of contact would be. Um, we also like to get out in the field as much as possible. So if we only have maybe one or two of our states impacted and we can get our supervisor to let us, John and I would rather come out and be with you guys. So we may leave the RCC if, it, if it's just, you know, main impacted, we may try to send one of us up there on the ground. It's always easier to coordinate that way. Um, and, and we try to do that as get out of the RCC and into the field as soon as possible. But yeah, we will always communicate with you who the primary point of contact will be, if we're sending anyone up, um, that sort of thing. John, did you have anything to add? Uh, no. Um, we Valves do have the opportunity to deploy to states for a non-declared IA disaster. Uh, so, so sometimes, uh, uh, even if it's a, a small disaster, and the state would like us to come up for a week or two just to uh, help with the initial coordination. We have the latitude to do that. And then, That's you know, the other thing I would I would uh, ask you all: uh, Do you have any um, uh, input for us? Are there any topic areas that you would like Katie and I to uh, get guest speakers for for future? with OAD meetings, uh, is there anything that we can do uh, to improve our services to you, so to speak? John, I, I think I can speak to that. I, I have to say you've been both great to work with. It's been a pleasure. Um, and I know that, you know, you work with other FEMA um, partners as well, like James, and, and I'm real, we're very grateful. And we do have a couple of topics down the road I'm going to reach out to you on uh, as part of our training. As many of you know, we have a, a one-year training schedule. We'll actually start preparing for the next round after the next fall. So, um, but you have been such a good resource and, you know, and, and, and I can't speak for the VOAD leadership, but I know they do really appreciate all the work that you and support you've given. Thanks, Bill. Anybody else have any questions for John or Katie? So there's another, uh, uh, Phyllis has a question. No, it's not a question. It was a suggestion. Yeah. Maybe have uh, the FEMA Region 1 Tribal Liaison talk about her role. That's working a great with the tribes. And, and Phyllis, we've done that in the past and we'll do it again. Uh, and uh, uh, Gina Murado is our tribal liaison. She's great to work with. She has a good relationship with the tribes. So that's a, that's a fabulous suggestion. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, just, uh, just in case, there's anybody on, on the on the call that doesn't know James. James, if you could just introduce yourself. Uh, he's our mass care uh, staff person down at the region. Hey, yeah, thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. So as as John said, I, I work on the individual assistance team. Uh, one of my roles is uh, supporting mass care and, and the ESF six function. If we do have an RRCC activation, um, I also work closely with uh, Bill and, and Ann and um, as sort of the primary IA point of contact for the state of Maine. So if, you know, if anyone has questions related to IA and aren't sure who to go to, um, you know, of course, you can go to your, your state point of contact, but also I can be a resource and help connect the dots if uh, you need to get connected with a specific resource within FEMA. Thanks, Bill. Uh, 
Thanks, James. We, we really like working with you all. So, know that. Um, the last thing that we might just, just mention, it's more of a somber note, but many of you guys um, may have been familiar with um, with Paul Ford, who has been a our deputy FEMA regional administrator in FEMA Region 1. Um, for, for many years, he's been a FEMA employee in Region 1 for 31 years, and he passed away on Friday um, very suddenly and unexpectedly. Um, we, we aim to get a message out to all our BOED partners because I know many of you have come across and interacted with Paul over the years, but um, thought it would be appropriate to mention that um, to you guys today, just to let you know that that, um, that, that has that happened, so. Um. Yeah, Katie, thanks for sharing it. I know um, Paul, Paul had uh, made an impact on a lot of lives and uh, very well respected and our thoughts and prayers are with his family. So I'm going to go one last round. Any questions? Well, hearing none again, John and Katie, thank you for all your work, your presentation, the information. Uh, again, thank you for supporting Maine. You're always welcome. Um, and we hope to see you in person soon as well. Um, again, everybody that's on the call, thank you. We really are. I'm excited that we have a cross section of, of a variety of partners here. And that's what VOID is all about, as John and Katie have mentioned. And, and keep it in mind, there's opportunities. Again, I invite you to join us next month um, for our next volunteer training session. And in our VOAD training session, please feel free to share the invite to anyone you know, because again, it, it's it, the more that come together, the greater impact we can have in our community. So with that, thank you everyone for your time today and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Bill and everyone else. Bye-bye.